Thanks a lot for these uh, nice words. My life home is a little more easy because when you come from civil society, you can have other responsibility than to run institutions. Home, I am running my milk farm and milk my cows, and life is a little more less complicated than here. But I have to say, distinguished participants, that these days is extremely important, extremely interesting, Mark, because I think when we talk about um, uh, dialogue, it's not only to speak, it's more to listen and to get knowledge and to take into account others' experience. When I'm talking about the civil society, I have to explain and to give you a little view what I mean. First of all, I think the title you have set for this uh, conference is extremely good. I don't know, Mark, if uh, you already understood the importance of the situation we have today if you look around on the global world. We have talked about terrorism. We have talked about uh, the possibility to come out. We have talked the terrorism and we have talked about the uh, culture of diplomacy. And I think the possibilities to come out of uh, terrorism could also be a tool for cultural diplomacy. When I make my contribution now, um, I will focus first of all on the two words peace and reconciliations, not on insecurity, because I think what the terrorism wanted is to let us be thinking about that, there is, that we are in an insecure world. We should not think that way. We should think that we are secured and that we are together. I am very happy to come after um, another flag from Finland, because if you go 200, a little more, 200 years ago, we were more or less, Johannes, one country. Now we are united in a union, together. And if you remember what was the celebration of European Union, 50 years of cooperation, it was the word, the word together. Um, first of all, the concept of civil society. I mean, you have heard the politicians talking about the need to involve, and you will always hear the politicians, the political world, talk about the need to involve and engage the civil society. If you read a document which was presented by the European Commission, just after what's happened in our partner countries in the Northern Africa countries, you can on the pages, because I did it, I counted the words where they used the civil society. Because if you remember, what's happening in a lot of countries was that um, it was not a political initiative to try to reform. It was a people's initiative. It could be part of the civil society, what st which started. But I have to underline for the politicians who perhaps don't like the word and the concept of civil society. Civil society responsibilities is not to take over elected people in the parliament and governments in their decision. The civil society is to give the, their engagement, their knowledge, and in a democratic country, in a democratic system, you have the right, you have the right to express your view. I think this year, we have focused very much on what's happened in Paris. Um, in the morning, there was mentioned, I think was Mr. Busek said, or if it was yesterday, that the French president stated directly after, we are in the war. If you go back to 2011, what's happened in Norway, in Utøya, there was a terrorist attack from a guy born, educated in Norway. The official reaction of Jens Stoltenberg, at that time the prime minister, was very well recognized. We will have more democracy, 
we will have a more open society. And I think this is one way to express when you are under this threat. During this year, and I will make, before I come to more concrete about the relations with civil society and the peacemaking process, I will um, remind us that we have had three international global events this year. First of all, if you go back to 2012, there was the big global Rio Plus 20 conference in Rio de Janeiro, which was a possibility for the global leaders to be together in the green room to present and to see how could the Millennium Development Goals, which now in a few days will come to an end, uh, be merged together with sustainable development goals. And we have to say that the global leaders did it. As you have said in presentation before, both yesterday and today, you have mentioned, even Johannes Koskinen mentioned the 17 goals. And besides, you have more than 100 more concrete different targets, how to reach. But if you remember, this is the big achievement of the global leader to have um, agreed on how to go further on after 2015. There was in Addis Abeba a big also global conference, how should the rich world uh, finance the transformation of economies in order to be sustainable for the poor world. I know that we are not totally happy with our, our, of the outcome, but still there was a result. And now yesterday, a different conference that has happened in Copenhagen some years ago, there was an agreement on the climate. There was a global agreement on the climate question. But it is not the ending point. It is the ending of the beginning. Now we have to deliver the result. And I think even the civil society have to raise their voice. As I said yesterday, I was uh, honored to be in the EU delegation to receive the uh, Nobel Prize for European Union. I know that there was criticized, um, was it fair to give a prize to European Union, etc. But if we go back to the beginning of European Union, I think we have to agree that few years after the Second World War, the leader at that time managed to make an agreement to a starting point of the European Union. This year, last week, on Thursday, there was a new Nobel Prize given to the quartet from Tunisia. It was mentioned yesterday. Um, and this is, for me, one of the best examples where you can see the activities, the initiative from civil society, how you can contribute. Because in, if you read the story, some of you know more than me, because some of you come from Tunisia. But the story is that the trade unions, that the employers, that the human rights and the lawyers' associations went together to manage to the politicians and to give them support. Because one way for the civil society, in my view, is to support, not take over, but to support and to get the politician's leader to take the right uh, direction. And they, they succeeded, as it was explained uh, yesterday. But I think there is two ways for the civil society to be engaged. First of all, like Tunisian, you take an initiative from the organization themselves. You have human rights organizations. You can read them more or less daily what they state, they report, they have monitored, they have visits, they have, like for amnesty, they have a view, how is the situation? But there is another way, and that is a more structured way. And there will I give you the examples for European Economic and Social Committee, because this committee is um, coming more or less from the, back, from, from the grassroots. Uh, it's a body which is created from the first time uh, in the Rome Treaty. 
the only body which was consulted from the European Union side when it was policymaking of lawmaking process. Later on, we have got the representatives of elected people in European Parliament, very good now, with a full right for uh, coup decisions. Um, this structured way gives the right to representatives appointed, in the case of European Economic and Social Committee, appointed formally by the European Council as individuals' advisors, but we can, with the background coming from different organizations, from human rights organizations, from Red Cross, in my case from the Farmers Federation, consumers, trade unions, employers. It is like if you look in a, in a, in a picture of a civil society in European Union. And we have the right to give the opinion. If you read the um, uh, European Treaty, Lisbon called Lisbon Treaty because it was signed in Lisbon, you can see that in 40 articles we are obliged, the Commission are obliged to give uh, us questions, referrals, and we have the right to put our opinions on the paper. And where we sometimes can find a way to a conflict mechanism solution is when we come to the social partners. I was once invited, because this concept of structured dialogue, you exist like in Morocco, uh, in European countries, not in Sweden, not in Germany, but almost all European countries. You have similar bodies in China, in Brazil. So it's a, it's a word um, concept, even if it doesn't exist everywhere. I was invited to Morocco a few years ago. They have restored, they have um, renovated, uh, we can say, the Economic and Social Council. I was invited to a plenary session. And there was strong voices between partners because they just discussed a model and way to sol uh, solve conflict, a conflict solution between the social partners, between the employers and the, tra the, uh, the uh, trade unions. Because even on the labor market, you know, we talk sometimes about the peace or non-peace. You have it in Portugal, where you have inside an economic and social body, you have a mechanism for how to solve conflicts without going to a crisis. I think this is a, a, a way for, for um, a structured dialogue where the civil society can play a role. I mentioned the case of uh, Tunisia, but there is a very important and interesting study, scientific work, long time ago when you have the conflict in Mozambique. How civil society organization, because it was 50 years of conflict, and of course, in between brackets, it reminds me a little about the bad history for Europe. Europe and European, and the colonialism, which is in our modern history, only find solutions of freedom. But in the conflict, and it was related to the conflict of, of um, Mozambique. But after 15 years, where the civil society played a role during the conflict, and to come out of the conflict, there is a very interesting um, scientific report. So I think there is a possibilities for civil society to play a role even in the solutions of conflicts. Let me once more underline that the political leader, the political responsibility is in the elected people, in the parliament, in the government. But I think it's a good tool for us to involve to involve the civil society, use us, and use the engagement in voluntary sectors. What could we have done with all this flow of refugees if we only have had the authorities? We have engaged people, we have people in human rights organization, in the Red Cross, who has done a tremendously work in order to be opened, to receive and to welcome people coming to Europe. I can continue to speak, Mark. I can stop. 
And I can tell you a very good tool if you have somebody to talk too long. Sometimes when the speaker too spoke very long, he needs to breathe. And he is silent. Then you can start an applaud. And he give the, got the message, time is over. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Nielsen. But please don't leave the stage quite yet. I want to give at least a possibility to take a few questions or comments, since you were actually very disciplined with the time. Uh, the reward is we get to take a few uh, questions and comments, which is always very interesting. Let's do ladies first for a change this time. I want to make sure we have as many voices as possible, and then we'll come to the front. Okay, if you please introduce yourself as well. Okay. Um, I'm Salma Popelzai from Afghanistan. I'm a member of the civil society working for women's and children's rights. Um, in your opinion, uh, a country like Afghanistan being a post-conflict or fragile country, uh, what is your recommendation for the government of Afghanistan to involve civil society uh, in the current situation of uh, Afghan people leaving the country and coming to the other countries, it's also a matter of concern for the, for the Afghanistan. We're losing our educated youngsters. So in what key areas uh, you would think that the government should uh, involve the civil society? Thank you very much. It's a, very, um, it's a difficult, uh, difficult question, I think. You are like Oracle. The Oracle, you can talk because the Oracle knows everything. But he has only three questions to you because some of the answer probably you have. But let me say a few words. I think a government could have extremely help if they engaged by a question of policy making, for instance and take the engagement from the civil society organization. You touch also the big question when people leave countries. I read just this morning a report from my country, Sweden, because you know we have, and I'm happy for it, we have a lot of incoming newcomers in Sweden. 85% is highly educated. So for the countries they leave, it's a, it's a really brain drain. For us, it's an opportunity, but we need to speed up the transformation of knowledge and the examine, et cetera, et cetera. There is a lot to do. But this is, for me, very important. Sorry for, but we, we can talk longer afterwards. Excellent, let's take a few more. I think you were first. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for the ICD for giving us the opportunity to participate in this important conference. Uh, today, no one questions the role of civil society in peacemaking process and solidarity between people, I think. But the question is whether civil society have the means to perform such task. In the third world, the answer is almost no. Consequently, our civil society should be given the means and opportunities to perform this, such task. We, for example, we are coming from Mauritania. We are associations. Uh, we are coming with our own means to participate in this important conference uh, to condemn terrorism and to, uh, to, uh, to condemn extremism and to promote peace. But this opportunity is not given to our friends who have the will and the human resources, but they lack means. So my recommendation is that we have, uh, to, be, to, we have to reinforce cooperation between North Civil Society and South Civil Society. Thank you very much. I can only agree. I thank you for your comment. I agree. And I said it was a very good comment. Excellent. Sorry, I was distracted. But for the final question, I want to give it to you. I don't think you've yet had a chance to ask a question. So if you could please introduce yourself as well. Good afternoon. My name is Bola Usman. I'm in Nigeria. I'm into sustainable development through climate change. My appeal and question is, is it possible for most of these people migrating for, from African countries or as refugees, hiding under problem in their country because of lack of livelihood, to be engaged and be given knowledge concerning renewable energy 
another thing that can be taken back to their country through your organization? This is my plea. Uh, I'm not quite sure I catch the question uh, totally, but if it was, um, you said that um, how to come back. Countries as refugees, even though they are pushed out of their countries because of lack of employment, maybe due to climate change or um, bad governance, they are now coming into Europe why can't the European and people like you and the ICD try and segregate them, impact knowledge so that when they come, go back home, it can be something they can impact on other people as multiplying effects? It's my plea. Yeah, I could agree, totally agree. But what we, we, what I think in, in a lot of cases, people flowing, they don't want, but they do it for the children they have, for their own safety. In some cases, they want to be back if there is a peace. We have seen it in the past. We have, in my country, a lot of people coming from problems in Chile some years, decades ago, from Turkey. They want to come back. And I think we should facilitate, but not as a tool to get them out of the country. Because in some cases, they have children grown up in a new place, uh, and they have the right to stay. I think we need to understand that the world is globalized, and I think even the European Union should in some cases understand and accept that we have a global world. I am not in favor to build more borders. I understand that you need to have some control, but I want to have an open Europe. That is my comment to you. Mr. Nielsen, let's take two more questions if we can, since first of all, you were so disciplined with the time, and secondly, because I really believe civil society is the highest potential, actually, when it comes to the future of cultural diplomacy, personally, I believe. Let's take two more brief questions. You've been waiting patiently, but please do try to keep them brief, and then we can. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Iqbal from Afghanistan. I'm working in Brussels as security analyst. Uh, in my belief, I think uh, terrorism and radicalism has uh, no religion, no humanity, and it recognizes no borders. Uh, in today's world, we are facing uh, different potential threats like climate change, ISIS, expansionism of Russia, uh, and other serious uh, threats. Uh, one, of, one, of, uh, one of the main threats is the new war, new war theory. And the new war theory is that uh, the, the perpetrators uh, uh, kill, for instance, innocent people, commit suicide attacks, or other kind of violence in different countries in order to intimidate their uh, political uh, 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 adversaries to accept their, uh, their, their demands. And uh, these, are, these perpetrators are used by some states uh, and they're called non-state actors. Uh, so some, some states use non-state actors as part of their foreign policy. Uh, my question to you is, uh, what is your, what, your recommendation to those states that use non-state actors as part of their foreign policy? Thank you. I think it's wrong. I think uh, to use the word non-state actors is wrong, at least in order to our traditions. But of course, even the civil society needs to be transparent, to be open, to be willingness to report what is behind. Because I can agree that there could be civil society organizations which don't want to make a good job, who even perhaps want to favor some uh, xenophobism or terrorism or whatsoever. And in some cases, I know, in the social fields, in some member states, there is an agreement with the cluster of the civil society organizations for so social issues and the governments in order to be transparent, in order to show that we are democratic. Non-actors give the wrong impression, in my view. How we can stop it, I don't know. Sorry for the too many questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I am Ahmed al Maligi. I'm an Egyptian peace activist. And uh, becoming a peace activist, uh, you have to study civil society. You have to study NGOs and conflict resolution and analysis. So I strongly believe 
in civil societies important role for the grassroots of the people that the awareness to spread the awareness and the knowledge but unfortunately i come from a country that the dictatorship mentality and dictatorship dictator regimes are in charge which means that knowledge for them is a threat so i pray and i wish that the european union pressure egypt and Canada and the rest of the middle east to let or give some freedom and space for the civil society ngos and the people who are working to spread the knowledge among the people because because away from the brainwash so please pray with me on that thank you the case it's a very diff difficult uh, um, remarks or ca question but if you remember yesterday it was also mentioned in one of the debates or the contribution about the double side of the eu relations to egypt because in some way it's not a democratic way and the uh, official protest from the politicians in the machinery of european union was divided and was doubled uh, standards you can say i would recommend you to see if uh, because i know and i have visit um, the Swedish, the, it, there is a Swedish institute in Alexandria. Do you know it? Because just close to the library, where you have also part of the um, running of Anna Lind Foundation, because this institute is for dialogue between European Union and the other countries in Northern Africa. But I can only agree with you. It's a very difficult, it's a very dangerous situation. Hi, my name is Dimas Savarenga. I'm the first secretary of the Venezuelan Embassy in Warsaw. And uh, you mentioned the COP15 in 2009 in Copenhagen, and I just wanted to make a comment uh, about that. It, it fits a bit, uh, I think, more with the previous presentation, but uh, also with this one. And it was um, President Chavez's speech in this conference. Uh, as he was approaching the premises, he saw a lot of uh, young people outside, and he read out... Uh, the banners, and he picked up two of the, the comments written in those banners, and uh, one of them read, um, and, uh, let's not change the climate, let's change the system. And the second one was, um, if the climate was where a bank, they would have saved it already. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. My only comments back, because it was not a question, um, is that, of course, as citizens and even as part of the civil society, if we have now motivated that we need the agreement, we need to take our responsibility and back up the politi politicians when they need to take some decisions which could, in our private life, be a little difficult. We cannot even here have double standards. So, of course, but I think it's a great opportunity to have a green planet, and better planet and the more social planet. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Stefan Nielsen. Thank you very much.